hello everybody and welcome to one of our final sessions here in Mexico City, but it won't be any of the poorer for it, I can assure you. In fact, it's arguably the most important question of all in this session, and I'll explain why I think that. Um, hello if you're joining us in Mexico City, welcome, and hello if you're tuning in online or catching up uh, from around the world. Hello to you, I'm Oli, uh, proud to be a co-host with Gloria here in the brilliant city of Mexico City. Um, when I share with my trusted network the sort of things I've been doing, I tend to take a view on them based on the quality of their questions, not what they have to say afterwards. I'm always listening to the quality of their questions. And one of the most pertinent questions I think you can ask when someone set out some bold goals is, is it working? Are we making progress? And that is the central question that we're here to focus on. And that requires good people. It requires some mapping. It requires more than a bunch of data. And you're going to see all of that on stage this afternoon. And it applies in all areas of life, by the way. I'll introduce uh, our kickoff uh, presenter in a moment. But last January, I was in Sydney. I'd made it all the way to Bondi Beach with my family, my two girls, my wife. And all I needed was Sydney's best ice cream. And that required good people. It required data and it required insight, and there was only one person to go to. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our first speaker. And, and, and not for nothing is she, is she so revered. But not for nothing. She is, of course, the Director of Knowledge Management of the IEPB. Please give a huge welcome, to set the scene, to Jude Stern. <laughs> Thank you, Jude. <laughs> I owe you. <laughs> Wow, quite, quite an introduction, and I've certainly never been introduced for ice cream before, but my kids will be very happy. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us today, this afternoon, the last session. It's very exciting, and I think, as Ollie said, it's very fitting that this is the last session, well, one of the last sessions for today, um, because we've talked so much about all the amazing activities that are happening, the strategy, the implementation, and um, now we need to think about or look at how we're going to monitor progress. How do we know we're making a difference? How do we hold stakeholders to account? Um, and, and of course, monitoring and answering all those questions are really important, but monitoring is also a tool to help drive progress. And you know, we've already seen that in some of this field, and Anthea will talk about that later. So I'm going to give a quick overview of the work that IAPB has been doing on uh, monitoring 2030 Insight. Uh, and then uh, my colleague Anthea will give you some of the results of it, which will be the more, I'm sorry, exciting part for most of you. <laughs> um, and then we will also hear um, from a panel after that to discuss progress. Sorry. Which way is it? All right. So, um, as you all know, and I'm not going to run through, I'm going to run through a couple of these slides quite quickly. We have a bold mission. We want eye health for everyone, everywhere. We have three core pillars that we're working to, elevating eye health into the economic, social and development agenda, integrating eye health across systems, and activating consumer and market change. These are big, bold areas to work in. Um, and we've, the approach we've taken to sort of look at how we monitor this area, we went very wide and far through a lot of consultation. At some point we had something like 25 indicators, I think, that we were looking at. Um, we used a lot of expertise that are in this room, uh, consulting wider than that. We have certainly used a lot of sources from the WHO uh, Guide for Action, the Indicator Menu, and um, the EXAT tool, as well as the strategy. And through collaborative workshops, uh, consultation uh, drafts presented to the board backwards and forwards, we finally came up with a set of three progress markers that we're going to look to track the strategy. Um, so, as a sector, uh, we know that we are looking to track our progress, uh, overarching progress, through two key areas. One, we have the uh, global burden of um, eye health, your vision loss data that gets done through the Vision Loss Expert Group, and that really keeps us track on how many people have uh, avoidable vision loss. 
uh, every four or five years or so, and we certainly, that is kind of the overarching umbrella. Underneath that, we look at the, the systems uh, indicators, and we have the two new indicators, effect, effective refractive error coverage and effective cataract surgical coverage. Um, that is also very important to keep us on track. They are two um, broad sector indicators that we are not measuring. We are looking at having a, um, how we keep track of the progress we're making on that via the strategy. So we're looking at the three domains of elevate, integrate, and activate, and how do we measure progress in that space? So the first one on elevate, we're looking to see if how we demonstrate um, progress on commitments to eye health. And so Anthea will go through this in more detail, but we have a commitment tracker to um, have a look at, to be able to enter the commitments that governments, non-governments, uh, other institutions are making towards eye health so that they can be kept in one place so we can see them. We can also hold them to account later by mapping progress. Um, anyone can enter these into the commitment tracker anytime, and we'll talk about that a bit more later. The second one is to uh, demonstrate progress towards integration into wider health systems. Um, and this we have done through a 2030 Insight Progress Survey at a national level. Uh, and this is done with key informants. And it can also be done year round. And we look to sort of have this updated every two to three years with those uh, national key informants. And the third one is around Activate, to demonstrate uh, activations and demand for eye health. And this is very much linked to the uh, Love Your Eyes and World Sight Day campaigns and um, measuring the amount of activation that is happening around that. Some resources have been developed to be able to um, start to roll these tools out across the sector and that will come, you'll start to hear from us over the year, coming year or so and so we hope that lots of people will get involved. But Anthea will talk more about that as she goes through what we've done and the results we've got so far. Um, so that was a very, very quick run through of what the work has been done so far. I'd like to, um, as a starting point, introduce Professor Rupert Bourne, who probably needs no introduction to this uh, audience. He is um, the lead of the Vision Loss Expert Group and was unable to make it to Mexico, but has provided a video and an update of the VLEG work. As I said, that top overarching indicator for the sector around the prevalence of uh, vision loss. So Russell, if you could press play on the video, that would be great, thanks. Well, um, first of all, thank you very much to the organizing committee uh, for very uh, kindly inviting us to uh, speak about the work of the Vision Loss Expert Group. Uh, I'm Rupert Bourne, I'm the coordinator of uh, VLEG, the Vision Loss Expert Group, and I'm gonna give you an update on, on where we are with things uh, currently. Um, and uh, it's a shame I can't be with you uh, in Mexico for such an important uh, meeting, but I wish you very well uh, for it. So in this talk, I'm going to update you on what's happening with the Vision Loss Expert Group. As you, I'm sure, know, the Vision Loss Expert Group uh, is the principal ophthalmic epidemiology reference group, and we've had almost 15 years of international collaboration. And amongst our group, we have more than 100 members. Most of us are principal investigators of the major population-based studies from around the world. And uh, they include ophthalmologists, but also optometrists. And we work across several um, regions, um, and there's re regional representation among the group uh, for uh, all the uh, seven super regions of the world. As you know, um, the data that we uh, produce is used, um, uh, this is data on vision impairment and blindness. It's used by the World Health Organization. For example, it was the foundation for uh, the data in the World Report on Vision. Um, and also uh, it was used, uh, the summary data for 2020 was um, uh, placed into the Lancet Global Commission uh, paper as well. We're very grateful to the sponsors of our work. Just to give you a bit of background, the Vision Loss Expert Group does a systematic review on a, on a regular, um, uh, repeated basis of many uh, unpublished and the published uh, eye surveys from 1980 to the present day. And it's a search strategy that we use, which, we, which is um, uh, repeatable, 
and it's commissioned from an independent organization to pull together the data uh, from published studies. And we check these data sources very carefully uh, for population representativeness and quality. And then these uh, data sources are placed within the Global Vision database. Now, within that Global Vision database, there are now over 500 population-based studies and their data. And we validate um, the data from that with the World Health Organization and produce prevalence estimates for vision impairment and blindness by cause, by sex, uh, and with time. Um, and uh, we work uh, with the Global Burden of Disease Study uh, to provide them this data, whereupon they add a disability weight to the data to create what we call uh, disability adjusted life years or DALIs, which basically is the currency for measuring uh, health uh, disability uh, or disability due to disease burden. This works really very important because um, in terms of advocacy, um, the contribution of blindness and vision loss uh, is very significant compared to uh, other uh, causes of, um, uh, of, of disability. And if you combine blindness and vision loss, for example, with age-related hearing loss, and think of this as sensory loss, then in terms of galleries from the GBD 2019 uh, data, the sensory loss actually ranked even higher than the dallies of, of, of diabetes uh, in those age 75 plus. So this is just one example of the importance of the advocacy work that we do. Of course, um, with the help of the International Agency for Prevention of Blindness, this data that we produce is available to um, everybody who's an internet user uh, through the Vision Atlas tool. And uh, this is the website for this. I'm sure you've seen it. Apparently it's had over half a million uh, hits. Um, and um, this is uh, from here, you can download uh, data from the Vision Atlas uh, to use for uh, whatever your uh, chosen task, be it um, writing uh, uh, research papers or, or creating the case for um, uh, uh, programs for delivery of eye care in different countries. I also want to focus on the work the Vision Loss Expert Group has done uh, with the effective refractive error coverage indicator. Um, and as you will, I'm sure, be aware, uh, the global target for 2030 has been set as a 40% increase of effective coverage of refractive error um, by 2030. And also there's a uh, a metric for cataract surgical coverage as well. And in the uh, UN meeting uh, in 2022, when we first published the baseline data for effective refractive error coverage, uh, which was then published into the, in the World Health Organization's report, we presented uh, the scientific case uh, for this. Um, and um, this work has continued because now we're in a situation where um, uh, we're updating the effective refractive error coverage work uh, with informatics experts uh, from among the vision loss expert group. And just to remind you, effective refractive error coverage is the met need over the met need plus the unmet need. Um, and uh, this is done uh, with um, a variety of methods. It depends on the data uh, that we receive, but there's a lot of data sources now um, we for the for the baseline EREC cal calculations, we had 22 population-based eye surveys, which contributed data that's of 95,000 uh, participants. In the most recent uh, EREC analysis, this is surveys from 77 countries, and and almost a million people uh, their participant-level um, data. Uh, on uh, visual acuity and uh, effective refractive error coverage is possible. So this has been a major step forwards in terms of the, um, uh, the coverage of data we have for effective refractive error coverage measurements. And you can see uh, this wide disparity between the super regions in terms of effective refractive error coverage um, uh, shown on this map here. Um, for all um, countries, I've picked a few countries here to show you, you can see how effective refractive error coverage is lower in people in older age groups. And we can also look at the 
uh, associations with uh, gender as well. This time in our new analysis for effective effective error coverage, which we hope to publish at the end of this year, uh, we've used additional covariates, which we weren't able to use for the baseline coverage, basically to strengthen the model. And we've used an expert elicitation process to do that. Many of you um, uh, at this conference have been involved in that process and we're very grateful uh, to you for that. We're going to be publishing uh, the data from the um, 2020 uh, model for vision impairment and blindness um, uh, very soon uh, in I, uh, the, the Journal of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists in their global eye health special issue. I'm very grateful to Zhao uh, Furtado and also um, uh, Sola Oluwolio uh, from Nigeria uh, who have worked very hard to produce this um, uh, series of papers. Uh, and also there'll be seven regional papers published, we hope, in ophthalmic epidemiology uh, very soon. Just to focus back on effective refractive error coverage, we're able to look at how different super regions have moved over the last 20 years um, towards this goal. Um, and this is very interesting and it demonstrates where the areas of work are, are, are really required. So we've estimated effective refractive error coverage for super regions in the temporal change. And we've shown increases in effective refractive error coverage over time. And now we've got this big um, uh, this opportunity to update the effective refractive error coverage data. We're hoping to be able to publish that soon uh, at the end of this year, hopefully in time for World Sight Day. Effective refractive error coverage is now being considered for inclusion in the results framework of the WHO's uh, new general program of work. So this is a big step forward and uh, we're working closely with the WHO team uh, in that process. That's important, particularly for the SPECS 2030 uh, program, which you'll be uh, familiar with. And the ultimate goal is to um, get effective refractive error coverage uh, adopted uh, through the UN Statistical Commission next year uh, onto the universal health coverage framework. And we have a major advance if we're able to do that. Of course, that's part of the sustainable development goals um, of the UN. Other work we do with Vision Loss Expert Group is collaborate among population-based study groups. And this is a meeting at Arvo where um, a group came together to discuss, for example, the UK National Eye Health and Hearing Study, uh, which has just got underway uh, in the UK. And so this is really important, particularly actually here, this is for high income um, uh, uh, countries where there's actually a, a relative lack of uh, with quality population-based modern studies. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for um, the continued support uh, of principal investigators um, of major studies uh, with Vision Loss Expert Group. Uh, we're very grateful to our funders and to the World Health Organization who um, support our work. And uh, I wish you well um, uh, over the coming uh, few days. Thank you. Thank you, Rupert. Thanks to Rupert Bourne, wherever he may be, with his brother Jason. He may be tucked away in Barbados. We just don't know. Can't handle the FOMO anymore. Um, so, so it's time for the moment that Jude has trailed a few times, and rightly so. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Jude's colleague at the IAPB, Anthea Burnett, just to give us that sense. But why I'm, well, what I'm going to say is. Number one, I'm really struck by the capacity of countries to help each other and the power of this network to help facilitate that. But I'm also struck by what Einstein said. He said, it's not that I'm so smart, it's just that I stay with problems for longer. And I'm really struck by the commitment of so many people in this network, in this room, for sticking with these problems. So, Anthea Burnett, we welcome you to the stage. Thank you for being with us. Hi, everyone. So it's my pleasure to be able to demonstrate how we are making progress towards 2030 Insight. So Rupert has just shared how we are measuring progress towards increasing effective coverage and reducing avoidable sight loss. And so now using the framework that Jude just shared, um, I'm going to be sharing what we've been able to collate in terms of effective progress towards elevating eye health, 
demonstrating progress towards integrating eye health and activating demand for eye health. Nope. Button. Got it. So this, this slide shows a summary of progress, and I'm going to be talking through each of these elements in detail, but this just is the top line view. In terms of commitments from the commitment tracker, we've got 65 total. Um, we've done the integration country progress survey in 34 countries, and there's been a whole lot of activity um, related to the Love Your Eyes campaign. So looking specifically at Elevate, the focus, as Jude mentioned, is to demonstrate global, regional, and national progress towards commitments that elevate eye health. To help us do that, we've developed an IPB commitment tracker. And we have a short video to demonstrate how that's been developed. Try again. The IAPB commitment tracker. In 2021, the UN Resolution on Vision acknowledged eye care's role in achieving the SDGs. Since then, eye health has been incorporated into other organizations and critical bodies of work. To further achieve the goals outlined in the 2030 Insight Strategy, the WHA and UN resolutions, it is essential for countries and organizations to make eye health commitments and mobilize resources to tackle preventable sight loss. To facilitate this, the IAPB has developed a commitment tracker to help us monitor these commitments. Ident I'm going to pause there because the slides are not, the video is not playing, the audio is. I'm not sure what's happened. Um, we'll come back to that if we can, but we've developed an, a commitment tracker. It's an online portal where everybody can um, input information about commitments in their country. We um, are aiming to be able to collate global, regional and national commitments. We've developed guidance documents around what a commitment is. And we would really love help in strengthening this um, aspect of um, the sector's work. We see this as, as a sector tool, and so we would really love to be able to work with you to strengthen these materials and work together to collect commitments so we have that accountability um, in, in demonstrating political will and demonstrating that eye health is being activated, that eye health is being prioritised. So the next aspect is around integrate. I've lost my place. So here we want to be able to demonstrate national and global progress towards integrating eye health within systems. So as Jude mentioned, we've developed the 2030 Insight Country Progress Survey. And it's been conducted in 34, actually 35, breaking news, 35 countries. Um, last night, thanks to Buziwe and um, Buziwe Mzeche from the National Council of Blind in Zimbabwe and Michelle Sun, a global ophthalmology fellow from Michigan University who has been helping us. Uh, we've now got 35 country progress interviews completed. So the purpose of the Country Progress Survey is to conduct a rapid review. And I, and I emphasize it's a rapid review. Rapid review. It's a rapid review of progress integrating eye health into wider systems. Uh, this, is, this tool is aligned with much of the terminology from the WHO eye care situational, situation analysis tool, i.e. the XAT, and the guide for action. So looking at some country progress data now, here is some of the individual country data. It's represented in a basic heat map. Green indicates minimal strengthening. Yellow indicates major strengthening. Mm -hmm. Grey is where systems integration needs to be established, and white is where we have no real information. So this slide shows the data that's been collected in, in a lot of the Afri countries in Africa. Encouragingly, there's lots of yellow and lots of green, um, indicating, particularly in the health integration um, and services integration. So looking at some of the other you know, regions around the world, and admittedly, the, you know, the data is by no means complete. We've got a long way to go, but this is just indicative at this stage. Um, for, but what we, what we can see here is there's a lot, there's a lot less integration um, in, in the countries where we have collected information or conducted this survey so far. So these countries in um, Europe, in our host region, in Southeast Asia, and, and some in Western Pacific. This process is relatively new. So we're working really hard to be able to work with members and their networks um, 
to be able to cut, collect a lot more country progress information so we can share this information and, and use it um, systematically. Um, moving on to Activate. This is, finally, this is about activating consumer demand. And the Love Your Eyes campaign is a fundamental component of, the, of this aspect of the strategy. And it seems to have an incredible reach and it's only growing um, each year. But of course, activating demand is, is more than campaigns, particularly when consider it ma considering market shaping and other types of inter interventions. And these aspects um, need more, more attention and focus in terms of measuring progress. So in addition to the um, commitment tracker that we've developed and the 2030 Insight Country Progress Survey that we've developed and have been um, more than piloting now, but testing, testing globally, um, we've been working on one additional approach, and that is to really try to connect this work to what members are doing and connect it directly to where members are working. So we're piloting a standardized approach for member activities mapping. I'm getting nervous because we've got another video happening. And so I have a presentation that I'm, I'm hoping you'll be able to um, watch from my colleague in our um, Kenya office, IAPB staff member Christine, Christina Nyabera, to present on some of the work that she's been doing in terms of member mapping in, in the Africa region. I'll let you do it, Russell. Hello, everyone. My name is Christine, a program officer for the Africa region at the International Agency for Prevention of Blindness. We all agree that our journey under the 2030 Insight Strategy is ambitious, and while at it, it is crucial to recognize the important role played by our members. These organizations not only extend vital eye care services to those in most need, but also provide a wealth of innovative practices that are critical to our shared vision of achieving universal eye health by the end of the decade. This graphic shows the bird's eye view of a national level. I see lots of activity. Hello, oh, everyone. My up, name perhaps? is Christine, a program officer yes. for the Africa region at the International Agency for Prevention of Blindness. We all agree that our journey under the 2030 Insight Strategy is ambitious, and while at it, it is crucial to recognize the important role played by our members. These organizations not only extend vital eye care services to those in most need, but also provide a wealth of innovative practices that are critical to our shared vision of achieving universal eye health by the end of the decade. This graphic shows the bird's eye view of a national level member map for the African region. We have done a strategy implementation mapping, which has occurred in 16 countries, among 12 members cutting across 43 country offices. This is a highlight of member activities in Kenya. We can see the members are deeply involved in a range of activities aligned with our strategic priorities, like advocacy and equity and inclusion. Each organization is playing a crucial role in advancing our shared vision. Their efforts in Kenya provide valuable insights into effective eye health initiatives and reveal areas where we can improve our strategy implementation, like inspector call taxes and duties and inspector call regulations. This representation of activities also helps us identify gaps in our strategy implementation. By mapping out these initiatives, we can see where more resources and efforts are needed to ensure comprehensive coverage and effective interventions. It provides an opportunity to fine tune our approach and address any areas where impact can be enhanced. We recognize that there are many other organizations working in ICA in Kenya that are not currently our members, but are equally doing significant work. As we look to the future and with the availability of more resources and funding, we hope to expand our mapping efforts to include this broader network and this will help us create a more inclusive and collaborative approach to eye health, ultimately benefiting everyone involved in this crucial work. Still at Kenya, here we see the power of collaboration. The members often work in partnership through a consortium, and this collaboration provides a framework for a multi-sectoral partnership essential for the 2030 Insight Strategy. They meet regularly through a technical working group forum, which provides a platform for lessons sharing. This collaboration helps them achieve more than one member can on their own, and they use the achievements to amplify and accelerate other work that they do. Through their collaboration, they have been able to drive joint advocacy ad agenda, through which they've been able to have eye health services included in the National Social Insurance Scheme, 
and have eye health drugs included in the essential medicines among others. In the south of Africa and focusing on Zambia, we equally see a highlight of their member activities. This shows what each individual member is doing respectively according to the strategic priorities as well as existing gaps in the strategy implementation among the members in Zambia. We can see focus on school health, equity and inclusion, affordable eye care services, and you can see a gap still in spectacle regulations. Through the collaboration of members in Zambia, here we see some of the highlights and achievements. Collectively, they've been able to launch the National Eye Health Strategic Plan. They were able to adopt the World Health Organization ASRO Primary Eye Care Training Manual, and they were able to improve the health management information system to collectively, to comprehensively capture eye health data, among others. Looking to the west of Africa and focusing on Ghana, here we see highlights of some of the activities carried out by the members. We can equally see the focus on advocacy, school eye health, equity and inclusion, among others. But it is also evident of the gap existing in spectacle taxes and duties and spectacle regulations. Members' collaboration and partnership in Ghana has equally yielded great results. There have been collaborative agreements with the Ghana Education Service to conduct eye health programs in the schools in Ghana. There has been an increased intake of ophthalmology residents in the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. And equally, the World Health Organization Primary Eye Care Training Manual was launched, among the many other achievements. Through this presentation, we have seen how member partnerships are essential for the 2030 Insight Strategy. Equally, the contributions of our members are instrumental in shaping, informing, and implementing the 2030 Insights. Their data and innovative practices, community engagement models, and advocacy efforts provide a robust foundation for achieving the strategy's vision of equitable and sustainable eye health for all. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And finally, we really want to make all of the, this information available to everyone. So here's a sneak peek of, of what we're calling Vision Atlas 3. We really want to build out the country pages so there's a lot more um, comprehensive data, um, comprehensive sight loss data from Vision Loss Expert Group, country progress data from the progress survey, um, commitments from the commitment tracker and member mapping as well. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll just quickly, um, just a couple of screenshots showing how we'd like to bring all this information together. This is, this is just our, uh, our dream and plan at the moment. Um, but we really see this as the start of measuring progress, and the only way that we can do that is to really work together um, in an effective way. Um, so please reach out if you or your organisation is in a position to align or assist or, or collaborate in any way. Thank you very much. Codes. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you once again. Um, that, that was really insightful. Thank you to Anthony and to those guests as well. Another round of applause. Thank you. Without further ado, let, let, me, ask, um, let me ask our next guest to uh, rush up to the stage as quickly as you feel comfortable. Talk to your neighbour because in 30 seconds I'm going to be asking them the million dollar question, are we making progress and if so, where? Let me tell you um, who's joined uh, us. Of course, Jude needs no introduction from the IAPB. Um, next to Jude, um, in fact, um, this is going to play havoc with my senses now, I know, um, but, but, I, but I can jump around, it's okay. Uh, um, um, ne ne next to Jude is Carla Ayres Musa who's the executive director at the BCVI, which is the Belize Council for the Visually Impaired. Thank you for joining us. Very nice to see you. Um, Drew Keyes is, of course, uh, recognized by most of us as the head of a uh, region for the Western Pacific and Latin America at the IAPB. Lots and lots of delegates in the house. Good to see you, Drew. Hope you've had a good, good gathering so far. Lots of, uh, lots of love for Drew in the house. Uh, thank you. Uh, next to Drew is Jao M. Furtado, an associate professor um, at um, PAH or PAHO, which I think is the University of San Paolo. Is that right? Uh, two affiliations, yeah. Yes, two University. affiliations, so two hats. J just tell us a little bit more what I say, PAHO. Yeah, it's a Pan-American Health Organization. Yes. It's the branch of WHO in the, in the Americas. 
Yeah, thank you very much. And great to reconnect with Jess Blakers, uh, who, who has multiple responsibilities at Light for the World, including being International Director of Programs, Advocacy, and Strategic Partners as well. Let's welcome them all to the stage. Good to see everybody. And I'm going to start with you, actually, Jess. Are we making progress? And, and by the way, full permission to be as pithy, as blunt as you like. Are we making progress? And if so, where? Um, I think we are. I think um, the presentations that we saw are exactly helping us to, to kind of turn the strategy that we wanted, like these big ambitions, to make them really, really practical. And so we can actually not get to 2030 and then be, what's our feeling? Have we achieved what we're doing? And I think it's really kind of pushing us forward. So Good. Okay, so I'm really cause for optimism. Okay, let, let's jump right round. Carla. Yes. Hello. Um, speaking from a country perspective, um, I think BCVI's history shows that data collection mapping works. It is how we have developed our programs over the past 43 years. Yep. It's how we went from strictly rehabilitation services to introducing primary and secondary care services throughout the country. So mm. from that perspective, it's something that's important to us and we continue to do. Uh, and what's an example of an area? We saw all those different ranges from schools to employers uh, on that chart. Is there a place in Belize that you're proud to be making progress in when it comes to eye health? There's still a lot to do, um, but our secondary eye care program is particularly um, booming right now, I'll say. Uh, we have implemented the country's first vitrectomy program as of last September, and that's thanks to, again, data collection, showing the need, yep. um, partnerships with yep. ophthalmologists and retinal specialists, yep. and then being able to implement for our patients. Kudos to you for that. Thank you. Drew. Yes, Ollie. Uh, we talk about uh, Elevate and we talk about the commitments that are needed from our policy makers and, uh, and we're seeing progress and frankly proof is in the pudding. We saw the call for action at the Commonwealth Health Minister's meeting last month. We saw the call for action at the SIDS meeting also in May and we saw Minister Humphreys here today. So yes, we're making progress. And, and, and I'm going to ask you to generalise, but particularly across your region, are there points of light? I'm not asking you to name specific countries, more areas where there is particular activity which really is rising up the ranks? It's particular activity in the Pacific Islands. There's particularly particular activity in Southeast Asia. And here in Latin America, we're seeing activity across the continent. Okay, and aside from geography, though, and it could be, as I say, in schools amongst the elder population, with employers, are there particular sectors or parts of a country, if you like, where, where really you're seeing the, the, the graph go in the right direction? We're absolutely seeing activity with the employers. We saw the, the World Site Day campaign last year was a, uh, a seminal moment for that, uh, particularly with big companies working in the sector, and we'd like to see that start to expand outside the sector. Yeah, good. Fascinating commitments for that uh, Love Your Eyes campaign as well. Jao, how do you see it? Um, definitely yes, but uh, I would like to point that, uh, focusing on the, on the data that uh, Professor Bourne brilliantly presented to us, uh, we are seeing a decrease uh, in the prevalence of blindness and vision impairment. So we are, yes, we are, we are making progress. But when we look at the absolute number of people with blindness and vision impairment, we are seeing an increase. And in, in in it, it seems weird, but I can, I can, I can explain why if, if needed. Yeah, but yeah and, and if you just shine a light a little bit more on improvements, I mean, more broadly as well, I suppose, in Latin America and the Caribbean as well, more broadly. I know you think about these sort of broader terms. Where we're seeing improvements? Um, we, we uh, in, in some countries, uh, we, by the time uh, we repeat uh, data collection, we see uh, a decrease in the prevalence in blindness, an increase in cataract surgical coverage. So yes, we are, we are on the right track in, in that sense. Okay, okay. Um, thank you. Um, I wonder if we could talk about that 2030 um, Insight Sector Strategy, Jess. Reflections on that so far, please. Um, so, I, um, I was part of kind of the group that was, this, the kind of task group that was first thinking about this, this yeah. strategy, and I, and I, it sort of, I had underestimated the amount of or how much this strategy would galvanize the sector, and I think that's what I'm most excited about. If we look at how focused the sector is, how collaborative the sector is at different levels, 
um, it's definitely not something that I experienced even kind of three, four years ago. So uh, that's where I think I'm most excited by the progress is how, we, how we're coming together behind the strategy. And if I asked you for an interesting finding, that, that is certainly an, an observation, but any, any nugget that you might direct us towards so far? An interesting... F F finding, a discovery so far through the work. Um... I, I, I'm really just coming back to what was presented before because I think, I think again, just making that, it, that this, this whole vision would have stayed very much a, a dream and a kind of a pipe, um, pipe dream and ambition of where we would want to go. I just I think this, this, the work that the Jude and, and, and the team has done to really break that down into very concrete commitments and progress at country level is is that's where the rubber hits the road so we can we can like each other in this group but if it doesn't yeah. come down to the country level then we're not making progress right so, so, so let's get back onto that country level Carla I'd, I'd love to just unpack a little bit more about what's happening in Belize um, what you're what you're doing how you're doing it and any secrets that we can learn from I think one of the, the strongest things that we've done, and this was actually done um, probably about 15 years ago in partnership with, with PAHO, um, was to be as a non-government, um, non-profit organization, providing a service not within the government, we were put on the Belize Health Information System. So every patient who accesses services with our NGO is included in the wider health information system. Mm -hmm. So that has really fed into the types of appeals that we make with the government. Mm -hmm. We have a memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Health. We've had that for going on 25 years mm -hmm. now, and we're looking at renewing that in the next couple of years. So all of that data and all the findings that have fed into the government system then come back when we sit at the table to look at where we need to improve. So it sounds like you sort of went from the periphery right into the center there. How did you do that in practice? Sorry, what, what's that? It, so it sounds like you, you've gone right to the top table when it comes to those health conversations. But okay. I'm interested in the how. This is a very, this is a 43 year old story. Um, <laughs> but really, it started. Um, as I mentioned, we were a branch of the Red Cross doing strictly rehabilitation services. <sighs> going again with the very first uh, register of people who were blind in Belize and finding that a lot of these people needed a pair of glasses or a cataract surgery. Mm -hmm. And so because the government and the health system was not offering eye health, they were very keen on working with an organization that could. So the Ministry of Health, Lions and Lions International, along with Sight Savers and PAHO, then started over the past you know, 43 years implementing primary eye care services and then secondary eye care services yeah. as well yeah, makes sense. so a very early partnership in yeah. being able to identify an essential yeah. an, service an, an, an amazing journey thank you um, Joe, I picked up on a phrase earlier the integration progress survey J just remind us and forgive me if everybody knows it just remind us what that is but also your reflection from that regional perspective so, Ollie, a little bit earlier when Anthea was uh, presenting, we saw the, uh, the snapshot of PNG that, that's up in the, uh, the IPB Vision Atlas, in the, in the prototype. And yeah. what I want to touch on there is the integration in action, yeah. the process yeah. that is actually a really important part of the integration. So in Papua New Guinea, we brought the entire PBL committee, the entire Vision 2020 committee, if you like, from PNG together. Anthea beamed in from Australia for an hour and a half, and the committee together developed their integration responses. So not only were we seeing how the integration was pro processing, progressing in the country, through the process we were bringing the stakeholders together, which is integration in and of itself. Really helpful, thank you. Um, Jude, I'm gonna surprise you with a question here because I was just wondering, on one of those charts, we saw, you know, members one through eight, and I was all, we were all wondering, I wonder who member four is. So <laughs> help us to understand the benefits of that anonymization versus naming and faming, which of course could have a more negative flip side because we want you know, the tide to raise all the boats. We want to be an encouraging, inclusive community. Help us navigate through that in terms of spotlighting success. So w putting those slides together, it was not necessary to name each group. And we don't expect every member to work in every uh, aspect of the yeah. strategy. Um, in fact, we're quite surprised how many members work across a very large part of the strategy. Um, and. But what it does is it has a look at the overall picture. Yeah. And when I presented that um, actually at the board meeting, at the IPB board meeting last year, 
we had people in the room that connected over that, Jess, I don't know if you remember, but you know, it was just so obvious that the, there was nothing around the refractive error markets. And there were people in the room that had specialty in refractive error markets, not in Kenya, elsewhere. They didn't want to work in Kenya, right. but they were happy to advise the other members. Because right. this, Jess, sounds to me a bit like a sort of IAPB superpower in terms of identifying gaps, facilita facilitating collaboration. Just take us a bit more inside that in practice, please. I think it's, it's that, that picture just helps you see it doesn't, it, it's not, it can't be a competition, it can't be kind of the member, I want to tick all of the boxes. It doesn't matter if one member go, does one box extremely, extremely well. It's going to be all of these things together that is going to make us move forward. And I think the other thing I wanted to say is four members who are maybe not huge and don't have a huge uh, monitoring and evaluation team, these are the kind of tools that can help them understand how they are contributing to, a, to an eye health sector strategy. Yes. Um, yeah. Do you, did you want to come back on that? I yeah. just did want to add to it. That's a slide of a summary of uh, a lot of information. Uh, what is collected is not just a ticker box, yes, no, I work in that area, but qualitative information about what they're doing in that area. And when we get the Vision Atlas 3 up and running, it will be made available and you will know which member is doing what so you can connect with them and uh, work together and amplify yeah, efforts. Thank you. Right. Um, Jao, Carla has set the standard now for telling a 43-year story in one minute. Um, <laughs> Patterns in Latin American sight loss and the Caribbean, actually, if I can extend it, if that's, you don't mind, that, over time. That's interesting because uh, in the early 90s, we had no idea what was going on in the region, and, and it was not that long ago, right? Um, and and we, we saw huge progress in all elements. We, we've seen like integration, um, reducing prevalence of blindness, the development of like training, the human resources, not only not only in night care, but uh, allied personnel. So uh, we've, we've, we've seen a huge uh, progress, although obviously we, there's a lot to, to, be, to be done. Yeah. And any particular cause for concern that's sort of flashing red on the dashboard, particularly in the last few years, perhaps? Um, uh, yes, but uh, it's not necessarily a, like a local thing, but uh, as, as we've seen in, in, in multiple presentations, right, um, we, are, we are improving numbers, coverage, etc. but uh, uh, most of our, focusing on cataract as an example, right, but we should, we should improve uh, quality as well. And, and it's not a long ago that we were just focusing on numbers. Now, we, and we shifted to coverage, which is great, but now we are shifted to coverage mm. plus quality. So we are, it, it's, it's a work in progress, and, and we are moving well, but more needs to be done. And uh, open question to any of you. Is, is there an area when it comes to mapping that you think ought to be attracting more attention because of the depth of the challenge or just the fact that it might not be as eye-catching as other things, but we could direct more attention towards? Where, where, where would you point us? Um, here in, in the region, uh, I think like just you know like the situation analysis and, and no fo not focusing only on medical data but you know human resources. This is something not only feasible that but but uh, a lot has to be done and uh, we can monitor and, and, and see progress over time. So because, we need to do more. Because I'd love, love to get your view on that, Jess. But um, Jude, I don't know how indicative that slide was, was of the broader picture. But I noticed too many gaps in that employers bar there and that just shouted to me as an opportunity for engagement and I, I may be barking up the wrong tree there. Well, when you're talking about measuring progress I'm really interested at what next year's survey will say because that was before World Sight Day ah. um, last year with so many people started engagement. And that was, uh, on the workplace focus right? Yes and I, I'm curious to how many more boxes will start to be ticked in that place because that opened up and that will also show us a you know, correlation to the campaign as well, right. which I think Lighting will be up. interesting. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Je just feel free to come on that. You don't have to. Yeah, I, was, I just wanted to make the point that it's so important to have that country level conversation because the context will be so different from one country to another and it'll depend on where funding is going and what government is interested in and all of these different things. So really bringing people together at the country level, seeing where the gaps are and then collaborating to to tackle them together, I think right. is, is what, this, what we can do. So, so I suppose my final question, I, I, I wish we will capture the answer to share with people who couldn't come to the session or didn't come to the session for whatever reason. And that question, I'll start with you, Jao, but I'll ask you each for your very brief answer, please. 
why, I mean, this group knows, so humor us for the next minute and a half. Why, in your words, is monitoring progress, process data and information so valuable? Why? Uh, we can only see a problem when we measure it, right? So without measurement, we, we cannot act. That's, that's it. Who will build on that, Drew? It gives you an opportunity to reinvigorate your national networks, which is the foundation of achieving the 2030 Insight goals. Yeah, thank you. Carla? I think the key is knowing that the more you can show, um, whether it's in a positive light or in a gap or a need, the more you can show your numbers, the better support you're going to get. So yeah, for us. such an important point. Thank you. Jess? It helps us learn, and that's the only way we're going to get better. 100%. Uh, Judah, I've got another final question for you about how we get more engaged, but what would your answer to that final question have been? First of all, I concur, concur with what everybody has said. They're all pieces of the answer, but I think um, what's important about this monitoring data is that we're trying to keep a finger on the pulse so that we can collectively, we and individually and down to national communities, react in a more timely manner and adjust as going rather than waiting till 2030 and having finding out then. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and so again, to be beamed beyond these rooms, how can people be involved in data collection, publications, monitoring 2030 insight? How do we do that? What's our call to action? Our call to action, I think the slide that was up before was uh, our number one call to action is to get involved in the commitment tracker. This is something everyone can be involved in. When you, So many of you are involved in uh, getting governments and other institutions and organisations to make commitments to eye health. Get them on the tracker so that... We know that as a sector, people can leverage that to uh, work towards, but we can also hold governments or whoever it is that's committed to account. Um, we also would love you to get involved in uh, the other aspects uh, and to do that, get in contact with Anthea and I and uh, we will point you in the right direction. And, and, oh, and, we, and we'd love to more? see that slide if, if, if it's not too um, onerous to jump back, sorry just because we mustn't miss the opportunity to grab that. Mm -hmm. And the one other area is the member mapping. Member implementation mapping is a survey for uh, national level officers. And so please get your national level officers to, um, to complete the survey uh, with one of us or one of the uh, heads of region uh, and uh, look to update it kind of regularly as well. Yeah, thank you. And you can join Jude and I for an ice cream anytime, any yeah, place. We can talk about best flavours later. <laughs> All that, yeah, that's competitive. Um, okay, well, thank you for rising to my challenge to be pithy and brilliant. Jess and Jao, Andrew, Carl, and of course, Jude, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>